Good evening, everyone. Welcome to my uh, weekly Node Red development live stream. Hour and a half, hour or so of doing some development work somewhere in and around the core of Node Red um, or some of the other bits and pieces we have around the outside. Uh, do say hi in the chat if you're here. Um, do leave a comment if you're watching the replay on YouTube. Uh, and yeah, we're going to crack straight into something. Um, so the plan for tonight is to start looking at a new thing, um, which I say with slight trepidation that it's not when I've got a, uh, a sort of a plan in place for right this instance. So it's going to be a bit of experimenting. We'll see how far we get. Um, and yeah, see, see what makes sense. So what we're doing is compound rules for the switch node. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, if um, once this just... See, it's my usual trick of if I don't get my workspace set up in time, then I have to spend the first 30 seconds, a minute or so of this live stream, sorting out my workspace. And right now my workspace is full of Flowforge stuff that we're not quite ready to share with the world yet. So... Um, just hiding a few things and making a few things disappear and reload that. And then here we have Node Red as you all know it. So, hi in the chat, we've got Jim uh Softy Decay, Reblo, Dunnan, Kevin, welcome. I don't think I've seen you on the live stream. Have you been on the live stream before? But welcome to you all. Welcome, ZRSOH. BPJ, I'm not even going to try to phonetically pronounce that, but you are all most welcome. Um, so what are we doing? Um, switch node. Switch node that we all know and love, which call you Bob. We'll call you Bob. That sounds good. Um, and mtoko1, welcome, Noxy boy. Oh, everyone's here. Better put on a good show. So we have the switch node. And the switch node works by you can identify a message property, be it message, flow, or JSON after expression, or an environment variable. And then you can set up all these different rules um, to uh, compare that property against and send the output um, to the different outputs. And that's good. It works. The problem comes or the, the limitation is when you want to do some logic around more than one message property, which is what I mean by compound logic. Maybe you want an and rule or an or rule. Um, oh, look at that. We've got spam in the comments, and I haven't got myself set up to deal with it. Let me just bring up my spam moderator dashboard, yada, yada. Um, yeah, so we're going to have a little think tonight about the um uh come on where's my dashboard stream manager uh connecting to chat oh and of course it's anyway yeah i should get some of you set up as moderators on this stream just to help squash the very rare occasion that spam stuff comes in so whilst I deal with that, I'm still going to talk to you. Um, so yeah, we're going to be doing, getting rid of, well, thinking about how can we improve this UI so that you can have rules that look at multiple, um, there we are, let's, oh, click, no. Oh, I, I honestly, the switch, the, the Twitch dashboard can be a real pain if you're not familiar with it. Um, kind of stream manager. Come on, this must be it. And uh, again, I open up the stream manager, and it only lets me moderate stuff that happens whilst I have it open. Anyway, okay, we've got some spam in there. I'll have to deal with it another time. Right, switch node, focus nick. Message.payload, set of rules. What if you want to say message.payload equals one and topic equals something? So compound rules 
um, compare different properties from different values. Now, you can sort of hack it using JSONata because using JSONata, you could actually um, concatenate payload and topic, something really hacky like that. And then uh, you know, perhaps you'd put in some delimiter. So you could do something like that. And then say you wanted a payload of you know, 123 on the topic foo, then you could compare it like that. But this is hacky. You know, this isn't what, um, it's just not what it should be, um, how it should be done. So, um, uh, that's what we want to look at tonight. Now, the configuration of the node is a little um, awkward. And I, I say that because, I mean, you can see, um, oh, man. Sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to deal with that spam comment. But on the live stream, it looks like it has been dealt with, but it's, it's showing up on this window, but it's not showing on that window. Oh, I give up. Let's carry on. Um, so the question is, how do we rework this UI so that rather than just having one property at the top, we can then start building up um, rules that compare different properties. And then you want to have like and clauses or clauses and... You know, we'll see. It, so this is going to be a bit of an experimental, um, not necessarily planning to get this to being fully functional tonight, certainly not in an hour, but um, I want to play around a bit with the UI. Can we get the UI looking sense, looking like it's it makes sense and um, is intuitive? So, and again, without really thinking about how will we store this configuration in the node itself, because that, that, would also need overhauling. So, um, uh, as it stands, um, well, maybe we do need to think a bit about how it gets configured in the node, but um, where to start? So, the first thing we need to think about is, well, at the moment, it's quite a nice compact UI because because we only have to specify the pe payload once, and then we can have these different clauses going down, and and it's sort of implicit. In order to do compound rules, though, you now need to have a property name in each one, which, um, yeah, which. Kind of, you know, if you're starting from a blank piece of paper, that would make sense because you want to say if payload equals one, then this rule, or if payload equals two, go to this one. But for users used to um, the current way it's configured, they expect to just set the property once and then the different possible values. So we don't want to force them to have to specify the property multiple times. Um, So, yeah, so the, the UI needs to have some intuitive way that you can set that once and then set a bunch of rules. But then on any one of these, you could set an additional clause that maybe compares something else. Um, yeah. So I guess one approach would be to say, you still have this property at the top, which is kind of like the, the master property that we look at. But that for any of these, you could click add to add a sub clause, um, which it gets applied as an or or an and, and lets you specify the same payload, this the same property as up there, or specify a different one. Um, so let's just experiment a bit with, with what that might look like. Um, so um, here we are in switch.html that builds up the switch UI. On edit prepare, the function that's called to build the um, UI. Let's just collapse some of this down. Um, 
input rule container. So that is the editable list. Um, then, uh, okay, so Steve asks, could query builder? Um, maybe something inspired by query builder, but we try not to, um, I'm just looking at its dependencies. Yeah, it's got a bunch of dependencies we don't want to be pulling in to Node-RED. It's Bootstrap, it's a um, whole bunch of stuff that, yeah. So, um, just so you can see what Steve was re referring to. Yeah, this is, this is the sort of UI we have in mind. Um, Uh, have we got any other screenshots? And, and it's certainly useful just to look at it, just to get straight in our mind what sort of thing we're looking at. Um, but you can see here, they do have the property that's being compared every time. So, yeah. And let's just leave that there just for UI inspiration, if nothing else. Um, yeah, so where were we? So here we have input rule container, which is editable list. Editable list is one of the um, custom Node-RED widgets we have that help us build up our UIs and build up our lists. Um, add item is the function that gets called whenever we want to add an element to that list. So this is the actual code that is generating the the UI for each rule. So this, this will get called for each rule that gets added. Um, uh, and so what's it doing? So it creates three rows. It creates three rows because I think is between, you know, some of the rules do, um, do necessarily spill over, I think. Uh, just flicking through them. Yeah. I'm just saying there's some slightly strange styling going on. Anyway, well, maybe I'm imagining it. Um, anyway, so it creates the rules and then it creates the all the different inputs, potential inputs. Um, uh, well, Steve, it's, it, it's not noise. It's always helpful to look at examples of, of the art of what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, like I say, I, I, I often find using third-party libraries for UI type stuff means you end up just trying to compromise into what they do and um, never quite, you spend more time just trying to tweak it and customize it. But yeah. Um, Anyway, so this is all the logic that's building up. So I'm just remind myself of what work this is doing. Select field on change. So that's when we change what type of rule it is. This first select box. This is where it does all the work to decide what needs to be shown and hidden. Um, I just want to check because we create three rows. Do we really use three rows? Yes, we do. Um, with some very strange hard-coded paddings. What goes into row three? Row three is, okay, is the rule between... Right, just to help us out here, I am going to... Um, make row two yellow, row three red, and row one blue. we actually deploy that then oh, we're not seeing anything why are we not seeing anything probably if I don't have Chrome tools open it's gonna have cached it 
No, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, and they're all collapsed because... Yeah, okay. Oh, don't view source. Want to inspect. I have to say, a lot of this UI stuff was written long before things like Flex were widely supported. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of this UI CSS could be drastically improved by moving over to Flex layout. Um, but... But here you can see we've got the content there. We've got the what says is the blue div has got that first row, so it's the select box and the first input and the output label. I think the output label is part of that div. Um, yellow and red. So in this instance, red has the two value down there. So what we're going to do is let's just try. I'm just going to. We're going to add another row. Okay, and then in this row, we're going to just throw in a... Um, oh, I'm rusty on this stuff. I know I've also been writing, as I say, Flowforge UI stuff all day, so I'm, my head is in view and it's Tailwind CSS, and I've just got a um, context switch back into node red stuff. Um, right. Often I find with UI stuff, it just helps break the ice, just throw a button, <laughs> throw a button on the page, which you instantly detest the appearance of. So you instantly want to do something about it. Um, and I just need to remind myself what the right CSS class is for our small buttons. That's how rusty I am, red UI button small. Okay, so we've got a little plus button. Does nothing. Doesn't look particularly useful, but um, see what was interesting, and I think me, rather than me describe it, actually, you can see it in the query builder. Uh, yeah, query builder. You can see they have these nested groups. Um, so I think an interesting concept is what if this property up here is no longer up here? What happens if that become, we have sort of nested groups so that you have a property you want to test in the table and then you can add rules against that property and if you want to test a different property for different outputs, you can add additional um, add additional properties down below. Um, so what would that look like? So at this point, <laughs> at this point, we're going to end up with nested lists um yeah okay this is all going to get a bit i'm trying to think of a way of doing this for you guys that is instructive rather than just hacky or yeah, rather than the approach, my natural inclination, which is just a hack away at this. So let's take a quick diversion. If we're going to do this, we're going to have to change the format of the rules, um, how they're stored in the node. And there will be migration code so that this is completely invisible to users. So at the moment, you can see the node has a property 
that identifies what we're testing against, and then it has a, an array of the rules we test against it. I'm thinking we're going to change this the rule structure now. So rather than this array being an array of rules, um, it's going to have an array of the property, which will be payload, and it will have a property type, which will be message. And then, and then it will have an array of rules as one of its properties. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I'm just going to hard code this in for the moment. And then I'll create a node of this type and deploy it. The runtime will go bonkers because it doesn't know how to deal with this, but we're not worrying about the runtime at this stage. So let's say we want to have a node. If we can get as far as just supporting this sort of arrangement, because let's say we've got those three and then you had another one of these which wants to go against message.topic. We'll call that four five six six okay so now we've got this sort of structure and now you could imagine this getting nested because um, we can then come up with a structure that then expresses a, an and or an or type expression within this this nested arrangement um, but the key thing with all this is that editable list is now going to be given an object that looks like that instead of an object that looks like that. So we need to modify this code to do something about that. Um, so how do we want to do this? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Steve. So, well, at the moment, the question, will we need and and or? Yeah, I don't know how and and or will get expressed in this yet. At the moment, this, this would represent three discrete tests. So each one of these would be an output and each one of these would be an output. The key thing being though, these are compared against message payload and these are, so they're not really ors, it's each one of these ends up being a rule of its own. Um, you know, it'll be its own discrete thing. Um, okay, so I've got all this logic. which just to help us out, I'm just going to comment all of that out and we'll add bits back in as and when, and I'm sure there's got to be some optimizations because there's, that's a lot of gawpy code. Um, and again, I'm writing this not worrying about migrating old nodes. I'm doing this purely for a brand new node. So in fact, what I'm going to do is reload. I'm going to delete that switch node, add in a new switch node, hit deploy, if we just look at the runtime, eh, okay, the runtime side hasn't complained, but we edit it and well, you can see it's added two entries into the editable list, which corresponds to the fact that, um, where did I do it here? We have got two things in the rules array, but I've commented out all the code that does any of the work to draw the content and what you can see here the the handle and the um x button they're standard features of the editable list widget if you say they are reordable which lets you drag them around or they're removable that lets you delete them and so let's let us 
um, start filling out what, what's the UI inside. So to begin with, um, and yeah, I'll leave it called opt for the moment. So we know we've got um, a property and a type. So the first thing we need to do is insert a um, uh, uh, typed input. So let's just find, well, we're going to start by adding in a row because Again, it just helps start throwing elements on the page and then see how they land. So, pen to, and my fingers will warm up and start, stop typoing so much in a minute. Okay, so we've got, we've got a row to stick this in. We're then gonna add in an input Send that to the row, and we want this to be a typed input with a default value of opt.pt, which is the property type. Um, and if that doesn't exist, default to message. I'm just cribbing from up here, <laughs> basically, because this is this is the line where we set up the existing um, typed input. So we want that and we want its types. Um, and we also want to set its value before we initialize it as a typed input and its value will be opt.p. And I've appended it, yeah. So let's go and have a look what that looks like. Okay, so now for those two inputs, we've got typed inputs with the different types, but they're blank. Why are they blank? They should not be blank. Uh, opt.p, hmm. Let's just have a look. What is opt? Evening electric rick, electric trick. And too late for tongue twisters like that. Um, Mm, okay, so we're not getting. What's going on? Oh, 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 oh right. Yes, opt is not. <laughs> opt is not quite what I thought it was. Opt is a nested object for reasons I won't bore you with. So. Um... Because we've got to keep track, if we reorder the rules, there's some magic we have to do to make the outputs, wire, any existing wires on the outputs, stay connected as the user might expect. So, again, I'm not going to get into that now. But now you can see I've got the two rules showing up properly, which is goodness. Um, so, having done that, we can do opt dot, what do I call it? Op dot r dot r. Hmm. Right. I'm going to call it a rule set. That's what we're going to call it. Uh, on the switch node, Zoramil existing. If you reorder the rules in the switch node, it will re. It does move the wires to stay attached to your rules, um, which is normally what a user would expect to happen. And getting that to work did hurt my head at the time. Um, I'll call them sub rules. I mean, in a minute, we're going to end up with some nice recursive work going on because, in theory, this should allow for arbitrarily nested rules. But let's do, again, it's one thing at a time right now. Um, So now we're going to iterate over the rules we have for this property and we'll add 
for each one, we're going to add in a row. Uh, do we want to add in a row? Hmm. Yeah, okay, this is, I'm sort of, again, rushing ahead a few steps in my mind and it's getting quite involved and quite complicated. Yeah, we're nesting. And if we want to be able to reorder within the rule, which a user legitimately want, then this isn't going to be the way of doing it. Um, just bear with me whilst I think this through because Yeah, we're going to pivot. <laughs> we are going to I just need to double check what we're pivoting is what we're doing. Because we have another standard component. You can see it over here. The tree list. And I'm just wondering whether the tree list is the better UI to build this up with. Um, yeah, we're just going to try it. Like I said at the start, tonight is about just some experimentation that, um, yeah, just Let's see how this works. It might be we scrap it and we decide, you know, lesson learned, this was just not the way of tackling it, which would be reasonable enough. Um, but what we do want to do is, so I've changed it to a tree list and I'm gonna go open up my tree list because I can never quite remember how to do this. Um, Da, 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 and then we just pass it data. Ooh, flick back and forward. No, no, no. Tree list here. Um, okay, so we're going to do that for the moment. Comment out that comment out yeah lot lots of commenting out yeah all of that is going to need re-implementing in some ways sorting removing um but that's okay this is why we're doing it then we want to take the take the structure we've got the rules array and we want to turn that into something a bit more, well, turn that into something that the tree list is going to expect. So, at the moment, each rule, um, So unlike the editable list, we don't add each item one at a time. We just pass it the complete data structure, but we need the data structure to be in the right format. So to do that, um, we are going to just for now set the label to be the rule property type 
and its property. We're going to set its children equal to the rule dot r, which is an array, so we can map it. And we want to return child dot what T V and V T, yeah, of course. Uh, T in fact. Do all that, we do that, we uh, data.push r, and then here we say dot tree list data is that array. Yeah. Oh, no, lots of errors. Lots of errors why I've got an unexpected identifier. Okay, I've typed, I've missed a bracket somewhere. That all looks okay. Have I commented out a bit too much or too little? Where have I mapped up? Nope, still got. Ah, yeah, okay. There, I missed a plus there. Quite why my local linter didn't spot that, I don't know, but. Oh, still got errors. Cool. So we have ups well, we have a tree list. It just doesn't show up. Um, and this is yeah. This happens. Why does this happen? It's because tree lists prefer being explicit in their size. So let's just um, sorry about this. Let's set their height explicitly for now. Again, we're going to have to add this to the list of things to fix, but. Okay, so we've got our tree list, but it is empty. Oh, and we've got a bunch of errors. Uh, undefined, can't read properties of undefined. Mm. Where, prepare, complete prepare, on edit prepare. Yes, I want this on edit prepare in the stack. No, oh. because I called it the wrong thing. Okay. So now we've got a tree list with collapsible sections. Um, and now we need to sort of sculpt it out from here. So. Let's get back to having our typed inputs for those those guys. To do that, at the moment I set the label to the text, which is why it has the text of message colon payload, because that's what that code is doing. What we can do um, is not set label. 
and we can um, let's see if we can do this as a one-liner. I had it as a one-liner up here actually, creating the typed input, which was this line here. Now the only thing I'm not sure on, this might not work, but we'll see. Um, except I need to change these guys now. It's rule.p, rule.pt, and the comma back. I don't think this is going to work because I don't think the typed input likes, likes itself being built before, yeah, errors. Row is not defined. Uh, yeah, no wonder. And it's, I think this is going to be the problem. The typed input works better when it's enhancing an input already added to the DOM. And at this point, yeah, see, they're, they're not there. So. We're going to have to do it in two steps. First, we're going to create the div. Then we create the typed input. And we append to that element. And now, because the input has a parent, we should be able to, this, this should now work. Oh no, errors, 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 errors. What have I done? Can we, no, let's just go look at the error. Um, unexpected token var. Okay, so unexpected, to oh, comma. <laughs> okay, so now we have our typed inputs. Some Slightly weird click event handling to deal with, but um, in fact, because we're, if this goes to plan, we are no longer going to use a, a separate row of the UI to specify the top level property. We're going to, it's all in the tree now. We can gain back a bit of vertical space. Um, and I should, I think, be able to set where is it expanded. If I come down here where I'm creating the tree data here. And if I set, ex oh, no, if I set expanded to true. then it defaults them to be expanded. And again, for, just for now, I'm going to... Uh, not, uh, do I need to close the element div? Uh, no, um, not, not in this bit of code. <laughs> um, jQuery, which we use, um, if you give it that, it, it creates a div element. It, if I had anything else, I would have to close it. Um, yeah, okay, it's, it's probably safer, better, neater to close it, so. All right, so now we've got these properties and these are the rules. Um, so let's do a little thinking. Okay, now we want to create the UI for each one of these. Well, we've got all of this commented out code that knows how to build um, UI for a rule. So let us do something a little rash. And 
wrap all of this code in a function. I'm just going to call it something for now. Um, and it expects to be passed in container, which is, yeah, container i and opt. So I've taken those arguments from the original add item we had. So we know this code down here will generate the right switch node UI for a specific rule that's passed in as opt dot r. Okay, we'll deal with that in a sec for a given container. So let's call this build rule row. So if we come down here, now um, so this is where we are building up all the child elements. So again, we'll create a container for it. Then we're going to call build rule row with child element as the container with um, Ooh, uh, we want the index. Quick, quick, quick. MDM array dot map. Array dot map. What if it's are? yes? So the second argument is the index. That that's what I thought it was. I and then the opt itself, which has to have for historical reasons. This. Is that all good? Is rule, no, rule should be child, i is i, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna build up that row for this rule. And then bear in mind, we're building up the, tr the children array for the tree data. And as we did before, instead of label, we want to set element because it allows us to give a custom element. Well, it's something. Okay, we've got the funky little plus button, which I'd slipped in. Let's just get rid of the funky little plus button because we're not ready for the funky little plus button. And I think at this stage, if I can just get back to somewhat status quo, <laughs> albeit using the tree list and this new UI structure, that would actually be a bigger step forward than we were. Okay, so couple of problems. Well, anyway. first the good. You can see we've got the rules are working. Um, you know, you can pick the different types and that all works. And from a UI perspective, I think this kind of hangs together. Um, yeah, there's stuff around. You can see rows are getting selected. We can I think we can disable that in the tree list because we don't want we don't want that as a, a UI um, feature. Then um, so two problems. One is yes, this initial width width is wrong. There seems to be it needs to do a bit of layout recalculation after it's been constructed. You can see the width stuff isn't getting set well oh, it's not resizing properly but i think that's okay because look down here you can see all these errors on on edit resize because we we have code at the moment to deal with resizing um but it it's resizing the old editable list it doesn't know how to resize what we've got so um but the other more well the other issue i won't say more immediate just another issue to fix you can see the outputs one two three one two three which obviously is not what we want because um, we want to have we want those outputs to be that to be a count going sort of global across all the rules so let's start an output count here um, so each time we call build roll build rule row I think if we pass output count there, 
and increment output count. Nope, doesn't add up. Um, it's not a function. Output count to a val. What did I muck up? What did I muck up? Oh, no. Bear with me. Okay, where's it moaning about this? And of course, it's not going to tell me. So why should it now be complaining where instead of passing in i, which is an integer number, I pass an output count and it complains. Okay. Is it just a missing semicolon? And people say semicolons aren't important. Yeah. No. Output count dot val is not a function. What have I mucked up? I have. So I'm passing in child element, build a build rule row child element. R is the child, which is the rule, and I. I should be just the in the index. So why would, oh, unless, oh yes, output count, uh, mm. output count is singularly a bad choice of variable name. We're just going to call it output counter because I have, output count gets used elsewhere. Hmm, well that hasn't worked. Um, why are we getting, ah, is that because, sneakily, I bet it's using, out, yeah. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Awesome. So, yeah, we could do a bit of a margin there, but that's that's working. Um, okay. I'm not going to worry about on edit save. We're a long way away from doing on edit save. Um, but what we want to do is... I'm not going to worry about Let's see, does that That should fix. Okay, so we, we're setting the height. We're now resizing properly for the height, which is good. We've still got the resizing, the rows is not working. Um, yeah, function resize rule. Where does resize rule get called? There. Oh, interesting. So the editable list widget lets you set a resize item function that gets called whenever the editable list gets resized. I don't know, does tree list 
have the same? No. Okay. <laughs> In some ways, all the more reason to move to Flexbox for doing the layout and just let the browser deal with it. Um, how feasible is it? Given we've been going an hour and yeah, we've got the beginnings of a UI. Um, it just would be nice to get these. Um, yeah, it would be nice to get these working a little better. So, what we're going to do so resize rule has got yeah you know, it's got all these magic numbers based on depending what option you've got selected how does it how does it resize the different things you've got um So the question is, can we change this to be Flexbox and keep it working? So I'm just going to short circuit resize rule to not do any work. So you can see, it, yeah, yeah, everything Everything is just defaulting to whatever it's been hard coded to or whatever it thinks, and that's not necessarily the right thing for it to be doing. But to fix that, we want to use flex layout. Um, so we need to find. So here's our build rule row. Um, Yeah, so this is going to be a good example of it's going to get worse before it gets better, is the only way of saying it. Um, and it, it should get better fairly quickly, <laughs> he says. Um, let's just deal with row to begin with. So we set displays to flex. And curiously, that has now jumped back here. Um, which is odd. Let us I think if we just Trying to think what's going to be the best way of doing this with flex because we do need it to change somewhat dynamically. So that is 120 span arts uh, float right. That's going to be the problem. We don't want that floating right. This, yeah. Um, oh man. Can we find where that arrow is getting created? Row, row, select. Final span, here it is. So let's not float it right. Hmm. Uh, final span, it's called final span, but curiously it's being added before other stuff. So let's just make sure we add the final span last. Okay, so now that's in the right place. 
Let's just go in and inspect because. Right. We've got flex layout with a select box, an input that's hidden. Oh, that, yeah, okay. So this select box, which I'm going to turn off its width. Um, I just want to make sure it's not got picking up width from anywhere else. Yes, it is. Okay, so we want to have its width set to auto. So kind of saying you be whatever width you want to be. But we do want it to be able to shrink down. So has there, no, it's not got min width. So we want to set flex grow, no, is it flex shrink? No. Okay, that's not about the select box. <laughs> Let's move on. So the typed input. Um, I'm going to set flex grow one. So by doing that, that typed input will now always take up all of the remaining space. This guy, we're going to just give him a bit of a margin around its edges. That's the one in the arrow at the end. Of course, by doing that, I've lost the flex grow I've added. Okay, so flex grow, but now you can see this span has, it's no longer centered vertically. Now, in the past, that's been a huge pain to deal with, but what I can do is align items center, and just like that, it's centered. I mean, yeah, if I toggle it, just vertical flex makes vertical alignment so much easier than anything ever has in CSS. Okay, well that's looking passable. I mean, this select box is still a bit big for the equals and it doesn't grow to its content. So um, There is a way in Flex, and I can't remember it. I have to go read the manual on Flex to remind myself how to tidy that up. But what, what we do want to change, though, is I need to set that Flex Grow on this typed input in the source. So um, I just need to go find where we actually create that. I think it's create value field, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Now, it creates the... Mm. I just bear with me whilst I think this through. Um, It is progress, but it's because it's a typed input, it's not. Sorry, I, I realize this isn't so enlightening. So this is a function that dynamically creates that input, but then turns it into one of our custom typed inputs. 
and it returns it because elsewhere in the code we actually need a handle on that input field. Unfortunately, we can't set. I don't. Th oh, okay. I don't think we can set. Oops. If I set flex grow one on that input, I don't think that CSS will get applied to the generated type input that sub gets put in its place. No. Um, what I might be able to do is, is awfully hacky. Uh, what is input parent? Let's just see what that that might be the DOM element that I need to get a handle on to, to set that CSS class. It is a div. No. It's not the parent, it's going to be the next sibling because, yeah, yeah, that's done it. See, that's given, got us a handle onto the typed input container, which is what we want. So we're going to set the flex grow style to one. Oops. And the function's called CSS because that's what you get with jQuery. Right. That should get us all of these inputs now. Oops. All of those inputs should now grow which is good. Kind of nice if these dudes grew as well, wouldn't it? Let's go fix that. Now we've got the basic pattern for doing that. We want um, this. In fact, I think what I can do Don't think we need to use flex for this instance because we only have the one element in the row. So we can just set its width to 100%, I think. Nope. Not when you, yeah, because when you screw up the syntax, it won't do anything. Okay, well, it's certainly 100%. Might be. Slightly nicer to do 100% minus, let's just pull it back off that edge a bit. Yeah. Okay. So we get, oh, and we need to sort out the align items on those rows, which was getting that arrow vertically aligned. I, I did it in the uh, browser tools, but not in the source code. So align items center. Where is it? No. Let's do line items yeah center that's what we want okay so if we ignore message or topic down here we're nearing um, equivalent functionality to the current switch node. Okay, it's still, I say nearing, we're not there yet. There's still some quirks like that, where we have, for all the rules that just have the single input, or, or even then, if there's no input, then that 
should still stay over on the right-hand edge. Anyway, we're, we're getting closer to a sort of feature parity with the existing switch node, so that even from a UI presentation point, it's a single property and then the list of rules that apply to that property. The key thing being, it now actually affords us some more flexibility so we could add some tests on another top level property or we could make this a and um, yeah, well, do something in the UI because it's a tree list, it can be you know arbitrarily deep nesting. Um, so we can come up with and groups or or groups, um, that type of thing. Um, I think that would make sense. Yeah, I think this is making sense. I think there's going to be something interesting to do at the top level. Like, once I've added payload, then I want to say, actually, it's payload and something else. So, what's what are the buttons? Where do we need buttons? If we go back to the jQuery query builder, you can see they've got all these add rule, add something to the bottom, add a group. And let's just delete those to see what it does. So... So here you can pick, oh, that's interesting. So you can pick, is it an and or an or? So presumably or means either that or the result of this group. And this group can be and or or. So, if, so you can add a rule to the current group. Or you can add a new group. Which, as soon as you have more than one thing in it, you can pick and or. Hmm. Okay. Well, I said at the start, we aren't going to solve this in one night, but for this sort of thing, it, it's, it's a feature we've had on the backlog for ages, and I've wanted to tackle it. But the UI has been the primary reason for not having tackled it. <laughs> so, if anything, even if this isn't a 2.1, ends up being in 2.1, even just you know an hour and a half spent poking at the UI, exploring art of the possible, what, what does it mean to change all of this stuff, then that's goodness. You know, that does help figure this think it through. Um, you know, let's just tidy up a bit more here. So what we need is um, what we need is we suddenly need to keep this arrow over on this side. Now the reason it's moved back here is we've hidden the input, which is what was taking up we had set flex grow on, so it's what was taking up the extra space. What would be nicer certainly would mean this little hack of input.next, which is a dirty hack, which I won't dwell on. It'd be nice to avoid having to do that. Um, let's have a look. Where does create value? It gets called three times. Where does this do the appending? Yes, it does. Ah, that's what I missed when I looked at this last time. Right, awesome, we're away. So we're just going to create a div. And on this, we can set the style, the flex grow to one. And this we can we append this to the row. Then this input 
we can append to that div. We can get rid, and in fact, we can just return that directly. So we're still returning a handle onto the input, but we've wrapped it in this um, flex grow, and we will also set on this one width 100% because we want it to take up the whole width of the div it's in. And with flex grow on the div, that means that div will now always be there taking up that space. And as you can see, it's not worked at all. <laughs> um, okay, what did I muck up? There's our flex grow. Oh, have I? Yes. That was silly of me. Again, I just, too many ways of setting this stuff. I've got the syntax wrong. I want to set the style attribute of flex grow set to one. Cool, cool. So the input is full size and it's growing. If I change this to one of the Boolean ones, the input's disappeared, but you can see the arrow is stuck over there, which is awesome. This is what we want. If we change it to is between, it all breaks. And why does it all break? So it all breaks because of this logic, which is dynamically adding the inputs as and when we need them. Um, before we had this span set to float right, so we'd CSS float would always mean it gets stuck on the right hand edge. Even if things get added in the DOM after it, it would be floated to always be to the right of them. Um, and that worked with this code because uh, it was a, um, for efficiency, if you've got lots of equals, equals rules, then you only need one typed input. You don't need to have the two typed inputs that the is between rule uses. So they only get created on demand if and as and when they need creating. But that means they're getting created after the fact. They're getting added to the DOM after the arrow two. And because arrow two is no longer floating, the layout just breaks like that. So we need to modify the logic is we actually, we need like a, we need a placeholder. Well, in fact, this div we created when we did the create value field, that just needs to exist. And it needs to have, be like a, a cell, row one cell. So um, after the select field, we then are gonna, so after, has that been appended? Yeah. So this is going to be um, input one container, let's call it. So down here, when we create the value field and we append it to row, well, to div, that's input one container. And you can see all of these that get appended to row, that's append to input one container because they are all um, so here you can see something added to row three. We don't worry about that. Row three. Here's one added to row. Which one's this? Type value field. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's let's see what this looks like. So they all look good. If I now go to is between. Yeah, so at least the first value. Um, yeah, I'm only concerned myself with this top row at the moment. And you can see that looks okay. We, we will sort out its width in a minute. Um, is of type. Yeah. Basically all these ones that add in different UI elements, they're getting added in this slot. So it, it continues to look just right. One thing we did was we set the width to 100%, which we want to copy over to these other ones we've modified. Um, 
and I'm also going to get rid of this margin left on these because much better to just set it once on the parent div, container div that we've added. So input one container, star, flex row, blah, blah, blah. margin left five. Okay, so the key thing is this field here is always resizing, taking up that space. Cool. Now, got some work to do, like, yeah, some work to do on this input because there are some values. Yeah, some values where its label is just bigger. So we do need to be able to grow that. Um, also the otherwise rule, that makes less sense when you're doing ands and ors because it's kind of meant to be the last. If nothing else above matches, then this one will match. And that doesn't make sense in an and or an or clause. So, yeah, that's a little well, added complication. But it's 25 past. Uh, this is, I don't know how much progress this feels like to you guys watching on and how much this made sense, but starting to re-architect this UI to use a tree list is going to make it much more capable of having nested um, compound rules with a lot of code reuse because we can just make it sort of recursive of how we render individual rows. And the tree list takes care of nesting and parenting. Um, and we have, there is code, mm, he says with some confidence, but let's, um, mm, maybe, maybe not. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, there, I, I think I've got code somewhere for doing drag reordering. Um, and something else we've got is the gutter. So you can see over here on the tree list, the little mag the icon that appears here. So it would be possible to have some icons and some tools over in the gutter here that may or may not be useful place to put some rules. I don't know. Um, yeah. Anyway, this is step one. Uh, how far this goes, whether I, I, how much more time I choose to spend on this right now, I don't know. I thought it'd just be interesting to break ground on doing some this sort of refactoring. Plus, if people have any suggestions or ideas, I think it's a long way to go to get to the sort of UI we need. Um, but as I say, just sometimes you just have to dive in and make a start on some of this stuff. So, yeah, I think I'm going to call it there. Um, I hope that was interesting. Um, I The editable list, the tree list widgets, I mean, we use them all over the place. They are genuinely useful, but I'm also aware <laughs> they're, they're widgets that I'm always impressed when I see third-party nodes using because I'm well aware of how little documentation there is on how to use them. Like the tree list, it literally is my notes <laughs> at the top of the source tree. Um, and the examples from where we use them, um, which in part is, I like to think of it for the first couple generations of a UI widget I create. I don't really want third parties using them because I want to reserve the right to change them and make them better and improve them, get them stable and 
tweak their the APIs they expose, and which I can do whilst the only consumers of it are within the Node Red UI, so I'm able to you know fix it up and be consistent. But I think it certainly gets to the point, like with editable list, which editable list is in the docs. Tree list isn't. I don't. I don't think. Let's go have a look. Um, but yeah, um, where would it be? API reference. Uh, editor UI widgets. Oh, tree list is there. Okay, I'll take it back. But even then, there's not. Well, there's there's more than nothing. Um. Yeah. And it just means we get some sort of consistency of look and feel around the place. Right. There we go. Um, have a great week all. I will be back next week. Same time, same place. Maybe picking this up again. Maybe I'll have a little poke at this. Uh, 2.1 beta should be with you all in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Beta, end of September. Final release, end of October. I think that keeps us in our three-month plan. And otherwise, uh, yeah, there we are. That's the live stream done. I'm going to go have a cup of tea. So with that, I wish you all well. Stay safe, stay happy, and I will speak to you all next week. Cheerio. Bye.